out of every tribe of the sons of Israel. Who are these people? Are they of today? Don't we wonder, am I in that 144,000? Well, if you read on to the other chapters after this one, you find that these 144,000, which is a figurative number, all had to die in the most miserable ways you can possibly imagine before they could reach the throne room that they craved. The figurative number, 12 times 12 times 1,000, 12 apostles of the Old Covenant, 12 apostles of the New Covenant, times 1,000, which means a long period of time, but, but one that cannot be designated, could go on forever for all we know. These are more than bloodline Israelites. We're talking about those of the Old Testament faith and those followers of Yahshua. That is what is told by the Revelator in verse 1. The word of Elohim and the testimony of Yahshua. We see those two witnesses throughout the book being brought up over and over again. And people wonder about the two witnesses. Well, all they have to do is look at Revelation 1.1 and then go to the book of Zechariah and look at that from 2 to 6. It tells you exactly who they are. And not only that, but one of the two has been recorded in history. But that's not what we're talking about today. Maybe another time. Old and new dispensations, those who had not become idolaters, those who had not worshipped the Baals or the emperor, while vast numbers, including the temple priests, did, did turn themselves over to idolatry and eventually turn the temple over to idolatry. This is recorded again in Josephus, who was there. And he was a Templar. He was a Jewish priest in line for the high priesthood. Even that, his father was stuck in Jerusalem when it was surrounded by armies and finally destroyed. In fact, I believe that Matthias, or Matya, who was Joseph's father, was the only priest to come out of there alive. But as for the 144,000, they are not to be touched until, until, until they are wiped out. Can those claiming to be of this crowd read plainly and explain plainly, at least as plainly as John did? Because we're going to see how they came to meet their death. Then one of the elders addressed me in 713, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and whence have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation, that tribulation that started in 66 AD, lasted for three and a half years before the attack on the city of Jerusalem itself. The seven years I'm talking about are 66 AD to 73 AD. From the emperor's standards being set up in the temple to be worshipped, right up until Masada. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. If I'm washed in the blood today, and I can be, what have I got to worry about? Do I have the, the big red dragon coming down from heaven after me? I would hope not. I believe that's all done. And I want to convince you in as little time as I have left, at least on this topic. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of Elohim. Now look, in this parlance, souls doesn't mean like the eternal soul. 
Hebraically, the soul is the body and the spirit together. So that's why the soul idea is translated over and over again in newer versions of the Old Testament as being. He became a living soul is translated as he became a living being. So as not to confuse a person as to what a being was as compared to an eternal soul, like Catholics believe and a lot of Protestants believe too. Under the altar, the souls of those who had been slain for the word and the witness they had borne. There we have two witnesses again, the word of Elohim and the testimony of Yahshua. And they cried out with a loud voice, O oh, sovereign Yahweh, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell upon the earth? The blood of venture, the gaol, spoken of in Job chapter 19, where it says, But I know that my Redeemer liveth. Later translations say, Avenger. This is a long held custom in Judaism that if somebody killed somebody in your family, you were to go and shed their blood as well in vengeance. This is the exact same word that mentions that. Now, how would Christians speak to Yahweh and say, avenge our blood? We're not supposed to be vengeful. It also sounds like, almost sounds like a Qumran saying, avenge our blood on those who dwell upon the earth. Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. You want to be a member of the 144,000 that he's speaking of here? 12 prophets times 12 apostles times a long period of time? You have to be living back then in order to be that. And your fate is to be killed. And in the most heinous, worst ways you can imagine. Next in Revelation, we hear about the Kadoshim, that is the saints, having themselves gone through that same portal that John went through, the door, into the sky and preparing for their next ministries. Not in the skies, but on earth. Revelation 5, 9, and 10. They sing, For thou wast slain, and by thy blood didst ransom men for Elohim from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and hast made them a kingdom and priests to our Elohim, and they shall reign in heaven. They shall reign on earth. Some of us are reigning now. We don't even know it. But not yet, says he. The reigning on earth comes when those folk are resurrected in the spiritual body and begin to convert the nations of this world here on earth. That's what the millennium time is all about. But that might be in the next message. What happens next is also testified by historians, three of them, and that is 12-7. Uh, now war arose in the skies, the urinoi in Greek. Always, it's always uh, translated heavens or heaven, but it's always plural in the original language, and the word means the sky. And in the sky, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they were defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in the sky, and the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent was called the devil, and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And then, and then I looked, 
And lo, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. We have these 144,000 set out to be witnesses in the earth who are slain, and all of a sudden, they're taken up into the sky. Where? To the top of Mount Zion to stand there with the Lamb, the armies of Yahweh. And there they are up on Mount Zion. They are taking part in this great battle that Yahweh claimed was going to happen and promised would, that is the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh. Time constrains me from talking more about this, but there is a lot more concerning why they're on Mount Zion and where they went from there. So we see they did arise. Then they went through the same door that John went through when he was no longer in the flesh, but in the spirit. And there they are on the top of Mount Zion, fit out as an army, just like Yahshua in uh, the first seal, going about in white robes on a horse, conquering and to conquer. And then all hell breaks forth on the lands that the Bible deals with. Babylon the Great is both Rome and Jerusalem in chapter 17. Both cities were on fire at the same time. Both cities were in rebellion at the same time. And then the rapture, as predicted by the earlier saints, came to pass. As it is recorded in the Revelation, and here in a minute, you'll hear it recorded in the historian. For here's how the war in the skies and the rapture is recounted by astounded historians who didn't know what was going on. First, Josephus. I'm going to read him as a token because there are two others that also mention it. But Josephus is special because... He was not only priestly, as I said, but he was there. And he writes, A certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable. Josephus, yes, it's a fable among people today. Were it not related by those who saw it, of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. I'm going to read that again. A certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable, were it not related by those who saw it. So considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. For before sunsetting, chariot, and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds and surrounding the cities. Moreover, at that feast, which we call Pentecost, as the priests were going by night into the inner court, the court of the temple, as their custom was to perform their sacred ministrations, and they saw the priest saw. Who did he get this from? Probably his father. They said that in the first place they felt a quaking and heard a great noise. And after that, they heard a sound of a multitude saying, Let us remove from here. Off they go. And this is Part of the passage, it talks about the priest going up to the top of the temple and trying to pass the keys over to those that were going up, which he was able to do. The keys of the temple went right up with those that were going up. Some are so afraid of the idea that rapture and revelation happened when Paul and Joshua said it would, and, and how that 
they go ballistic against me. And whoever else understands what is hardly a mystery anymore. Why are so many so obstinate that they must make a mountain out of a molehill on every religious text? Why would anyone believe such nonsense anyway as these false prophets predict? And that never happened. I don't know how old you are. I'm 67 now. I've been involved in church all my life, and I've been hearing this since I was a child. Predictions, predictions, and being brainwashed in church that with movies and with preaching, that this thing was going to happen, and we had nothing to worry about and left, unless we were left behind. Then we were on our own. But as the years went by, more and more theories, and then more and more, and then those theories were no longer theories, but they became facts that probably came out of the mouth of the devil to the point where, as I said, people are scared, especially the people that don't know much about it. And there was actually a movie with top actors and actresses in it here recently called The Rapture, where everybody disappears. Everybody disappears. And there was another movie where a terrible, monstrous space beast, a red dragon, comes down to Earth and the armies of the world fight against it in open combat in Texas. You saw that movie. I think it was called The Beast, done by TVN. So many of these latter-day futurist prophets are, as the Dead Sea Scrolls describes them, cracked pots. But again, Paul tells us plainly why. Because they refused the love of the truth that would have saved them. For this reason, Elohim will send them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie in order that judgment will come upon all who have disbelieved. I'm stumbling around here. In order that judgment will come upon all who have disbelieved. It's almost like in blogs and on social media, people are reveling in the idea that judgment will be coming upon all who disbelieve. Their love has gone cold. Don't they care about other people? And YouTube videos are astounding and sensational and at the same time ridiculous. But people believe them. People believe them that all this is coming down. Now look, in my lifetime, it's been coming down all along. And my mother, the same thing. She says in her lifetime, she's 87, all the same messages are coming down in a thousand different ways as to what this is all about and what's happened. I just thank the Father that I have been able to get out from under that delusion and see these scriptures as they were meant to be seen and to understand them as they were meant to be understood. But I'm thinking I don't want to be a prophet of this because what happens to prophets, to prophets, False prophets stone them, and that happens to me. Yet more than you know, people like me, who believe and know what's happened, and people I know who know, we get laughed to scorn and avoid it. I don't know how many people have told me, I'm not going to come around the Ahad because you people all believe that revelation already happened. But they won't take five minutes to listen to why we might believe that. And they say might because I don't really know what the rest of them believe. The question they ask is, if revelation has already happened, what are we to look for now? Or there's nothing to look for now. I really pondered over this question and the answer, and I didn't get it, and I didn't get it. Then Thursday night, or I should say Thursday morning, I often sleep till noon or later. 
I had a terrible nightmare. I had a nightmare that my shirt was full of fish, fish hooks that had leeches on them. And this was inside my shirt and I woke up tearing my shirt off. But sometimes that's how Elohim gets my attention. Because that wake up call might have been only for the purpose of giving me the answer to this question so that I could relay it to you two days later. It's an easy answer. It's always overlooked, and I've overlooked it, and you've overlooked it. What happens next? Yahshua gives that answer to Kepha. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in Elohim, believe also in me. Isn't this kind of a hackneyed saying? We've heard it over and over again. Yeah, it's an easy out, isn't it? It is not an easy out. Yeshua also says, have faith in Elohim. And again, a voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son, listen to him. Sometimes I'm quite sure the Bible gets in the way of having faith. It's used as a crutch. Almost everybody uses it as a crutch. It certainly used to be for me, and that's why I dedicated my life to understanding it. I know what it is saying, but I also I know what it is not saying now. I think Yahweh would like me to be on some kind of crusade with this message. But like one minister told me years ago, Jack, I'm just not a crusader. I find that I am not a crusader either at this time of my life. So what happens next? The things that we should have been doing before we speculated happens next. Have faith in Elohim. Have faith in Yahshua. Watch and wait. Let not the Bible bullies beat the mind Elohim has given you to a pulp with nonsense. If you know him and trust him, if you know him and trust him, the word of Elohim and the testimony of Yahshua, if you know him and trust him, everything in the future is going to be all right for you, no matter how many days of hell you recently believed were upon us. He's going to take care of that. Or only you can change that. Nobody can change it for you. Your Jesus cannot do a thing for you without trust. Yahweh Elohim can't even answer your prayer without trust. He certainly isn't going to endow these people with the deep, deep truths of the history that already happened just to waylay you into a delusion. But if you'll simply trust him, trust him, and get yourself off of that addiction to the cracked pots of scandalous future history. Turn your mind, heart, soul, spirit, and life over to him. Then allow him to help you use right judgment as you look at the scriptures. They are not infallible. They are not inerrant. But their message is unified, and it's a good message. And despite, despite, uh, despite, all prophetic utterances, there are also historical stories in here, and that's what you find in Revelation. When you get that right judgment, you're going to be able to go back to those passages. And you're going to find out whatever is in store for you and wherever it is. So you have my permission to believe in your own rapture in the very way he did it, 
before 70 something AD. Trust and obey. There's no other way. And all is good. Amen.